就是。Okay. Hello, everyone. We are going to start now, so please feel free to enter the room and join the first rows. The, the seats are marked reserved, but it's, they are reserved for you, basically, so don't be shy. Come closer. We want this to be a, an interesting conversation, and, and we want it also to be as interactive as possible, so the closer you are, the better it is. All right? Okay. So... All right, thank you so much for joining uh, this session about e-commerce in Africa and women empowerment. Uh, the late Kofi Annan uh, used to say that there is no tool for a development more effective than the empowerment of, of women. And based on that, we know that um, if we manage to redu reduce the digital, the gender digital divide, women will have access to more, to additional income, more employment opportunities, and more information uh, overall. And that might benefit the women, their families, and the society overall. Unfortunately, uh, to these days, on top of the technological barrier, there are a lot of individual policy and cultural barrier that are preventing women in Africa to fully benefit from the um, opportunities offered by e-commerce and, and uh, digital economy in Africa. So basically what we want to spend the next few hours um, doing here is identify the important areas where gender uh, disparities are encountered as well as share great uh, good practice seeking to address gender issue in Africa. And last but not least, discuss possible solution or action area to increase the participation of women in e-commerce and digital economy. And to do that, I'm surrounded by a very rich panel of extremely um, talented and knowledgeable people. In, as you can see, it's a very diverse panel as well. So I, they will have the opportunity to present themselves, but basically you have female entrepreneurs. We have people from uh, founders and organizations that support women entrepreneurs to build up their capacity uh, in, in Kenya and Africa in general. We have trade advisors from the European Union. You, you have uh, some of the, the, the uh, the, some of the highest representative of UNCTAD, um, as well as uh, UN women, and uh, last but not least, scholars and um, civil society representative, as well as a representative for the World Wide Web Foundation. So please, um, I think I'm going to start from my far right by Aisha. Please, Aisha, can you just tell me who you are and what you do? Hello. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Candice. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to, to be among us today. Uh, I would like to thank you, UNICTAD, for giving the chance to be in this wonderful panel. I am uh, Aisha Juridi. I am the North African Regional Coordinator of the African Civil Society on Information Society. I am a human rights activist and uh, mentor and um, uh, policy analyst. Uh, that was all. <laughs> all right. Hi everyone, uh, it's good to be here. My name is Monica Keretz. I'm an academic at Strathmore Business School and a policy and ICT expert and I sit on the table of many of the ICT policy issues. Yeah. 
Good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting you and women to be part of this panel. I'm Zabib Kavuma. I'm the representative here uh, in Kenya for UN Women, and um, we work in a number of areas um, in Kenya and beyond, ranging from women's political participation to economic empowerment, um, ending violence against women and girls, and also peace and security. Thank you. Yes, um, I am Isabelle Durand. I am the Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD, and uh, of course, uh, because we are two, huh? Dr. Kitui and myself, so uh, an African uh, man and a woman from EU, from Europe. So uh, I'm dedicated to the, the question of gender, not only in digitalization, but also in digitalization, and I will explain that later. Thank you. My name is Alessandro Tonoli. I'm the trade advisor in the delegation of the European Union here in Nairobi, and I deal generally with all trade matters, specifically with uh, uh, policy matters and trade negotiations. Thank you. Uh, my name is Winnie Chapkemoy from uh, SNV Netherlands Development Organization, and my uh, expertise is uh, gender, policy, and trade. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Catherine Mahugu, founder of Chiswara, an e-commerce platform that sells specialty Kenyan coffee to the international market and we provide a more equitable coffee experience for drinkers and farmers alike. And also I'm a proud member of the Ankted and Alibaba e-founders and um, we are shaping the, we're shaping champions for the new and digital economy. Hello, my name is Nancy Amunga. I run Dana Courier Services. We do last mile delivery. I am also an e-founder and an impretico. Yes, amazing. So as you can see, we have like a very rich, rich panel and it's, uh, we really expecting the conversation to be extremely exciting. Um, just for the translation, I'm going to ask Isabelle a question in French. Is that okay for you? Très bien. Uh, donc, uh, Isabelle has uh, uh, as a uh, like answered. What do you think as a major barriers for women engagement in the economy in generally and also digital economy in particular? That's a big question. I would like to give you time to take your headsets. Of course, the digital economy is not the only place where there are barriers or, or obstacles for women engagement. And I think seriously that in all my contacts, in all my uh, f former experiences, the worst enemy or the worst obstacle is a woman herself, woman herself, for many reasons. The insufficiency of uh, self-confidence, uh, lack of self-confidence um, that you can uh, uh, succeed in a business enterprise or economic uh, endeavor. And success is not the first thing that comes to a woman's mind for many reasons. Maybe it's uh, cultural or linked to the community or linked to the fact that it's the, not the first role that is given to the woman. The woman is not uh, business people by nature. They're supposed to be economic actors. And then uh, other obstacles, uh, obstacles linked to the community itself, the uh, social structure, which do not expect that of you, and sometimes actively or sometimes passively are going to relegate you to uh, some lowly jobs, or if you're talking about economy, we will say that women have access to microcredit or micro project. Everything is micro, nothing is macro. So they have only access to a small slice of the market uh, to buy uh, vegetables next to their homes. So we are propagating this narrative that a woman is not necessarily somebody who can be head of a business, who can launch a project or at a m much larger scale, a woman who does e-commerce. And if they're there, they're not very many, they're not very visible. And third obstacle is uh, a general obstacle, 
sometimes it's legislative at UNCTAD, we are working a lot to analyze the legislative texts, among them uh, what you have to spur investment and all that, and we realize that in many African countries, women do not have access to property, they don't have access to inheritance, they don't always access uh, to bank accounts, they have a, they need a series of uh, uh, authorizations when our husband's uh, spouse's authorization to open an account. Uh, so I agree that you need to do something with your husband, but uh, his tacit um, authority is not really necessary. And in some countries where legislation has changed or, or access to property, uh, access to bank accounts is given to women, sometimes there are cultural uh, obstacles that uh, hinder implementation of the laws because for many communities uh, it is not really in their nature. So I think if we want, we need to work in the economy generally and in the era of the digital economy, if you want to bring down these obstacles, we need to bring them all at once. We should not imagine that with a good law, things will change on the ground. And it is not enough to work on the ground to imagine that structurally, women are going to engage as they should and as it should be normal for a society, for the well-being uh, of the country and well-being of the economy. They will not, they, they will just be doing uh, livelihood uh, activities, but the sum of those uh, small projects will not uh, give them the rightful place they need to uh, take. So for all these reasons, and it is good that we have around here uh, people from different uh, uh, backgrounds, uh, legislation, general, and also the local uh, context, who are people who are entrepreneurs and who are going to give a better testimony than my set, mine on how to bring down these obstacles. But I really think that the first obstacle is an individual or a personal obstacle, and it is probably the most difficult one to bring down. And it, 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 it's not just the only sector, because I come from a political background, and I believe that without uh, rules and uh, quarters, women do not feel that they are capable or sufficiently stronger, uh, trained to uh, engage in something more than local economy. But if you want um, bigger uh, positions in their countries at national level, they don't really feel uh, equipped to do that. So it is true for economic and politics. Uh, and men generally, men don't ask themselves that question if they want to become a politician, become a business person, become a minister, they don't have those problems. It's automatic. For a woman, it's not automatic. So those are the obstacles that you brought down. There's no reason why women should not be able to uh, set up businesses to get into the digital economy and to run projects other than micro projects. So we should stop this uh, micro projects. I don't like this idea, even if you start small, and that's something, if you know that access to funding is a problem, but to have just uh, micro-projects that are reserved for women, it's not a good thing. It's, it is not something that's going to help us uh, in this world. Thank you. And I've said it. Thank you. Beyond being a, a, a of authority in, the, in, in that field, Catherine is also very passionate, which, which we, we love, right? Don't we? Absolutely. So, um, Zabib, as the, the, the Kenya representative from, from UN country, can you deep dive a little bit into what you have observed as the inherent uh, gender barrier that women face in Africa when it comes to um, economic, their economic empowerment? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I think some of the issues may have already been raised by Madame Durant, but I think um, it's important to note that there are inherent discriminatory practices, and whether it is through you know, culture, norms, patriarchy, uh, gender stereotyping, or whether there are discriminatory laws, whichever way we look at it, just by the virtual fact that there are women, there is already an, 
uh, any type of inequality that already exists, which we must also look at and, uh, and see how to address that. Now, um, I will just give a quick example, uh, because in some of the studies that we found as UN Women, if men and women played an identical role in the labor market, because currently they don't, uh, as much as 28 trillion US dollars, or 26%, could be added to the global GDP. So this already tells us what are the benefits of inclusion, of economic inclusion for men and women. Um, and, and we really, that's our starting point. Uh, it suggests, say, that it's unacceptable for women to not be, um, you know, accessing whatever it is that they need to access, whether it's land or resources, uh, and also be given equal opportunities. Uh, and this can range from, you know, education to, 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 to practice. Now, um, I, I, I want to also uh, say that in most cases we find women in the informal sectors. Um, and this is really, really key. And therefore, they are not counted. They are just not counted. So any work that women do that is in the informal sector is not counted. And all of this work, uh, when we talk about household work, you know, when we talk about unpaid care work, all of this has no value. Uh, you know, in, in the sphere of the economy. And, and, and we are really um, agitating and saying there must be a way to be able to value the time and the use of time of women. Uh, and that needs to be translated into some kind of a monetary value. Because um, a lot of the times where you are in the informal sector, you drive the economy, but you have no say. You have no decision-making power uh, to be able to influence legislation, to be able to create an enabling environment. And, and, and so we have to also shift the narrative a little bit and say, those who are in the informal sector, how are they being recognized? And what kind of contributions are they making to the growth uh, of the economy in any given country? And that's whether it's in Africa or beyond. Um, I think I also want to emphasize a little bit more on the legislative framework, because it is important to have, uh, you know, uh, an environment that is conducive, uh, whereby the laws, the policies, the regulatory, um, uh, you know, uh, elements are really, you know, conducive for women to participate. Uh, because sometimes there are hindrances. You know, you have laws, for example, that say that women must get consent from their husbands, you know, to be able to work or to own land. You know, all of these things don't help anybody when they're trying to be, uh, you know, I empowering themselves economically. I think the, the, the other area is the whole issue of data. Um, we are also realizing that obviously a lot of the times when data is collected, it is really not uh, aggregated in a number of ways, and especially in terms of sex disaggregated data. And when you don't have the right data and you don't have the right narrative, it's very difficult for the policy makers and those who are, like you said, at the decision-making table to be able to really um, ensure that there is some level of equality in what it is that they're pushing. So it is important that we have the right evidence and that we, we are evidence-based and led, uh, especially also when it comes to ICT, because the users, for example, are different. You know, the way women use and, and, and men are very different. Um, and our national um, statistics offices also don't give us anything about access to ICT for men and women. Um, I think another area when it, we look at the e-commerce is also affordability. Uh, we know, for example, the cost of handsets and the price of data usage, things like that are also not necessarily conducive for women who don't have that kind of level of income. Uh, so that is also something that needs to be looked at. Um, That's actually very interesting that you point that out because um, Nena, um, you are from the uh, World Wide Web Foundation, and basically what you, you, you do is um, helping like, improve, like reduce the digital inequality by influencing the re relevant policies with different types of projects. Um, as Zabib just said, um, one key issue is the lack of data to, to, to know where we are coming from and where and how we can make uh, how we can fix uh, this issue. We know, for example, that when it comes to the, the sustainable development goals, uh, one of the key indicators that is monitored is uh, the number, the proportion of, of women 
who owns a mobile phone, which is quite a good one. But do you think, as someone who is more, who, whose data and statistics are more part of your, your, your mission, what other data do you think should be taken into account uh, to monitor the progress in closing the digital gender gap? Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Nenna. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, first of all, the, the digital gender gap is only the digital phase of the gender inequality that already exists that uh, Madame Durand was very passionate about. about. Uh, so it is these offline uh, traditional divides that have come online, right? So when we ask, do you, when you ask a woman, do you own a mobile phone? And she says yes, and you tick it off. What does that mean? Incidentally, goal five is the one that actually has the highest level of digital readiness among the 16 plus one goals. If you look at goal five, it has more, which means uh, for those of us who, who lived through the, 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 the first goals we had, the what do you call them, MDGs. We didn't talk about, we didn't even mention the internet in those days. But now it seems that the spirit of the SDGs is that digital empowerment is what actually we need to raise inequalities. Having said that, um, on the Africa level, we used to have two initiatives on, on statistics. There used to be one run by the AU and the ECA, and the other one run by the African Development Bank. Uh, but since last year, um, all the African agencies have decided that we'll be having just one, the, the Africa Gender Index. So that is going to take into consideration agriculture, that is going to take into consideration maternal health, that is all of the indices that we want to have there. Um, what would be the ad advantage of the Africa Gender Index compared to the pre-existing one? It's going, to be, it's going to be meshed, and it's now in the spirit of the SDGs. Now, last year, end of last year, I did organize um, a workshop uh, trying to pull together the actors in Africa who work on gender and those who work on data. That was the first time it was happening. People who work on women issues have been around for a long time. The people who work on gender and data are very new and very few, and we don't talk to each other. So I'm happy that UNCTAD is having this kind of conversation so we can see ourselves. Some of you here know me in other ways. And so I was invited to speak to these African statisticians, and we're talking about um, how to improve the gender reporting, the gender statistics. Here are two things I found out. In terms of energy, you know, SDGs, we are heavy on um, energy and um, use of energy because that is where African women spend much of their time, fetching water, fetching wood. And like um, the, uh, the UN woman lady saying, we don't have the qualification for this. So we don't have data. And on, we know women spend time drawing water and fetching firewood, but how much of their time? How can we capture this in, in an indicator we don't know? Coming to digital, that you own a phone these days is not enough. We need to find out. Um, from the Web Foundation point of view, we have something called React, Rights, Education, Access, Content, and Target. What are you accessing on your phone? First of all, is it connected? Do you have any kind of connection on it? Because um, some people still use it to do allo allo, you know? So, some people don't even call, they just flash and you call them back. You know what it means. But they still own the phone, anyhow. So we need to find out, um, is it connected? What kind of connection do you have? Is it broadband or not? Because this will, if you don't have broadband internet connection, there are so many things you can't do online these days. In addition to that, I think we need to ask, do women use the, the cell phone as a tool for education? Do they use it to enhance their rights? 
Because if we're talking about bridging inequalities, we're talking about breaking down the old barriers. So if we do not have indicators that will measure how women are using their mobile phones to go beyond these barriers, then we are missing it. One last one. We ask uh, how many girls are enrolled in ICT classes. I have fought my way through the through two years, but I didn't succeed yet. How many people enter is one question. How many people stay through is another question. Because I, I met, my, my daughter just graduated as a computer science student. 70% of the girls could not finish. So it is not enough to, to enroll. It is important that we find out if you finished and if you stayed through. Those of you in ICT here, um, I've seen women who open businesses. I run a business. I have a business in my name. It's an ICT consultancy. But two years later on, you close it because you can't pay the internal revenue, because you can't measure up, because you don't have the equipment. So it is not enough to say how many women own ICT businesses or registered ICT businesses. It is important to know how many are really in business and how much is being made. I will stop here so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nena. I really love how you go. Please clap for her. <laughs> I really love how, I mean, we have all here heard of these issues and indicator, but it's very rare that we go beyond the face value of the indicator and see if every, actually people are either using the phone, uh, going through the education, and having a sustainable business. Good one. Thank you for, very much for that. Uh, talking about, f from another perspective, um, Aisha, so you are uh, the representative of, for North Africa of the African Civil Society for Information Society. According to the Civil Society, what, what do you think is the key issue regarding gender economic equality? Thank you, Kandesa. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, civil society sees the problem as le three layers, three main layers that we uh, I am going to like um, conducting throughout the, my intervention. Mm -hmm. These three layers include, first of all, the sensitization or the awareness. Women in Africa lack a lot of a lot of uh, sensitization and awareness about their role or the role they're playing in trade and uh, in in the development of, of economy. And that's also to say the uh, electronic economy. Uh, they also lack awareness um, about that there are new fields that there are that will promote them and help them promote uh, African society. And, the, and these new fields are the, digi the, the digital field or ICT and uh, ICT ecosystem. So um, the second layer is, uh, of issue is the education. Women tend to choose um, uh, agriculture or, uh, or um, women-like fields to, to work on and to, and to establish career on. They tend not to go to uh, tough fields like ICT or like technical, technical uh, realm. The third layer is uh, the policy making. Women are not included in the policy making positions. They're, they are excluded. And that's, um, that's a major problem when it comes to setting regulations which set a balance between men and women participation in uh, economy and in decision making. Thank you very much, Aisha. And that's actually very true because the, the lens through which we wanted to address we, this issue is that we need more women involved in economy and more women involved in digital economy. And this at different layer of the value chain. So you want more women users, you want, you want more women creating value, more women designing, creating value as business owners. So more women creating or designing technology to be part of it. And last but not least, more women uh, having a seat at the table of the policy making uh, uh, conversation. And talking about that, uh, Monica. Um, I think, you know, you've, you've already mentioned the four mm -hmm. areas that um, I think e-commerce and ICT and women play in. And uh, let me defer to the ladies that have already spoken because they've spoken so well. Yes. Um, how does a woman become a user of ICT? I think that's a question we must ask. Um, 
using the phone is one thing, as you've said, but then how do you become a user to make it financially viable, to make it into a business orientation? And that means, first of all, that the woman has to have business skill acumen. Um, we can't, and I, I like Madame you know, Durant who said, you, we, can't be in the, we can't be playing in the informal sector only. It actually gets to me as well. Um, it, it is important that we begin to think about, and maybe let me start by saying, how about the fact that we, don't only, we also don't talk about professional women? Why is it in Africa that we only talk about the mamamboga? Mamamboga is another term in Kenya for the woman who sells and does amazing work on the, you know, just trying to stop subsistence farming. But we never talk about the professional woman in Africa. So we never see her. The face of the African woman is only seen from the woman in the village. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's important we bring both women to the table because they exist. And because those two women are also trying to play in the ICT field. There are enough women who are professionals in the ICT field, but we don't talk about them enough. Instead, we focus more. So what I'm saying is that we need to have a balance when we speak about African women. We need to be able to show the businesswoman in Africa who is doing amazing work. We have very many of them. In Kenya, we have Njeri Rionge, who started the ICT and was part of the Wanainchi online, an amazing woman. In, in, in Zimbabwe, we have Divine Dukula, who began an amazing job and entered security and began using ICT in security. We have Bethlehem in Ethiopia, who began this shoe company and began doing amazing work. So they are there in the professional sector, but then how do we bring them up to the table and how do we make them play and use? Now, if I go to the informal sector, the question is to ask, it's not enough to just be on the mobile phone. How can we ensure women are, have business acumen, can be able to trade, can be able to think about what it means to, to make a payment system and to make it online? So I think there's one user. Then there's the design. And when we think about design, I think the question we need to ask is, how many women are actually ed being educated on the back end? And as um, you know, Madame Durant and Kavuma and you know, all the rest have spoken, it is intimidating for us as women sometimes to enter the ICT field. Um, and, 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 and we need to be able to encourage more women playing in technology, who are able to speak about back-end numbers of zeros and ones, who understand back-end technology like ABC. Um, and, and this is something we want to encourage. In this room, we talk about women in ICT, and when we, when we use the word woman, we're talking with Zebi here, then you already bias the room to women. But if maybe we begin to think about gender inclusion and it's everyone, so that even the men, and we only have one man on this table, thank you very much, um, then we can begin to have more men talk about women and talk about the need for women to be included in a lot of these things. The, last, the third one, value addition. How can women in all the sectors, agriculture, fishery, whatever it is, um, really begin to add value addition using technology? And that is only and can only happen if they understand the technology. So I think a lot of emphasis needs to be played on using the technology, playing with the technology, understanding the back end of the technology, being able to use the front end and how it can help them. And then, of course, policy making. Um, we don't have enough women in any policy making in Africa. We, we, we have very few. And that is something we can encourage by beginning to demand for more numbers at the, at the table to engage on these issues and to speak about these issues. I'm going to stop then and allow you to continue. Clap, please. <laughs> clap, clap for her. I told you this was, was going to be a very exciting panel because people are knowledgeable and passionate, which is absolutely amazing. Talking about gender inclusion, <laughs> <laughs> Alessandro, as a representative of a, a European Union and trade, trade advisor, what do you think from a, a trade standpoint, what do you think is, are the biggest challenge um, about, uh, around women economic empowerment? Thank you. The problem of speaking after brilliant compilers is that so many issues have already been raised. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to say something. Um, first, uh, if I may, before answering directly the question, uh, um, the issue of microcredit uh, was raised. Uh, also, Monica um, mentions the fact that, I mean, all this talking about uh, micro instruments, micro dimension, micro is, is, is really annoying. I was thinking about an initiative here in Africa uh, called the Lionesses of Africa, which is, which is in a sense, I think, precisely the opposite of this approach. Uh, okay, Lioness, uh, in, in, as an image, of course, evokes a number of... Uh, but I think it's precisely the right approach. It's, it's moving from the opposite uh, uh, dimension. I mean, it's not about... Uh, 
uh, always thinking of ensuring the minimum for survival for the household, it's about something more. And I would say that by looking for something higher and something more, by default, you will get what's, in, what's along the road. While if you are focused from the outset exclusively on achieving a minimum result, I mean, it's of course something good. I'm not saying that it's not good, but can be sometimes uh, counterproductive. So more lionesses of Africa. Um, uh, from, from, a trade, uh, from a trade point of view, there are of course lots of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, good examples, success stories in Africa now that can be mentioned. Uh, I would probably uh, focus uh, those uh, who have something in common in terms of uh, uh, networking. Um, that is to say, all those program projects, uh, initiatives, uh, whatever the donors and, and, and the origin, uh, that focus on uh, networking women uh, who uh, deal with the same matter, working in the same sector, and uh, try to establish connection uh, in the case of, for example, of suppliers with buyers. Um, this is something that works very well. Uh, there are a number of programs. One is from the International Trade Center in Geneva. The idea is to uh, training, mentoring uh, uh, one million women by 2020 uh, so that they can link, that they find a connection to the markets because the markets are there. They can easily, more or less, depending on, on the, uh, the situation, the starting point are, are, are reachable. The point is to not allow women working in the same sector to go all alone by themselves, but to share the information they have, um, to establish channel of communication, for example, with buyers uh, elsewhere. Um, this, is, this has been done on continental dimension in Africa, at regional dimension, I think of uh, uh, Trademark East Africa, a number of uh, member states of the European Union are involved in many of, uh, uh, of, these, uh, of these programs. Sometimes it's about uh, training, uh, more or less formal, sometimes formal, it may be about uh, uh, trade regulation, tax law, it may be about uh, Sometimes it's just about sensitizing uh, about practical problems faced in everyday life by cross-border traders, by women who work as cross-border traders. It's about how to make the best of uh, um, uh, a crossing point uh, in between two countries in a formal, official way. Uh, it's about how to uh, react to situations in which uh, uh, bribery uh, or other uh, illegal behaviors uh, uh, pop up. Uh, so I would say networking, uh, uh, sharing, putting together information, and finding uh, uh, ways uh, uh, to uh, build links uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the markets. Um, this African community, uh, as a regional economic community, has also, uh, I think, uh, made this contribution. For example, by um, sharing uh, simplified uh, trade guidelines for cross-border traders, uh, um, has tried to do precisely this. Uh, to provide uh, in the daily life, daily work activities of women uh, who work uh, on the borders, uh, uh, those information who are of immediate usage in their, in their daily work. So among all the possible success stories and, uh, and, and good examples that can, can we make, um, I think that this one uh, is something that should be replicated, should be um, uh, supported at all levels. Uh, again, always national level, regional level, continental level. Uh, I, I very much like, and the European Union is the first financial supporter of uh, negotiation at continental level, so we are very much in favor of the Africa um, uh, continental free, day, free trade area, but I always try to remind to my uh, Kenyan colleagues uh, uh, that uh, it's very important, uh, first, uh, well, or in parallel, let's say, to work on the regional dimension. It's very difficult when you negotiate with other 54 uh, countries, uh, very different. We know, that in Europe. we know perfectly. <laughs> Actually, we, I'm, I'm talking on the basis of the mistakes we made. It's precisely that. I mean, there is a lot that I think can be learned by the mistakes we have made in Europe. And uh, uh, working with neighbors at regional level, that's really the starting point. Because, uh, however, well, you can uh, know uh, the market of Egypt or South Africa, it's more likely that you have a better insight uh, into the market of Tanzania or Uganda. Usually it's like that. There may be exceptions, but it's like that. So um, uh, considering all different levels, uh, 
Um, and uh, on, on data, on statistics, uh, just one word, uh, there has been a session, uh, or it's in parallel, uh, where a colleague of mine from Brussels uh, um, uh, has to present uh, uh, what is called DESI, the Digital Economy and Society Index. Even in Europe, finally, we have understood this. Uh, when you collect uh, uh, statistics, uh, well, the gender, the women uh, dimension uh, now cannot simply be left out. Uh, and the problem is that in order to tackle a problem, uh, okay, we can call it a um, digital gender gap, a divide, uh, however we want, the problem is to be aware about the scale of the problem. How many women are we talking about? where they are, what type of uh, access they have to internet. In this index, for example, when it comes to the digital dimension, uh, there, is clearly, uh, there are clearly a number of indicators uh, which try to cover precisely these areas. And this is not something only for, for Europe, but it has, it has been thought uh, to offer, uh, well, some, some, I would say, suggestions or, uh, or uh, models. Uh, maybe sometimes simplify depending on the resources available also to, to other countries. Thank you. A big applause. Yes. Thank you so much, Alessandro. <laughs> Uh, talking about, um, talking about uh, like Alessandro just talked about how it's important to help women to uh, do business at a, at a bigger scale, uh, cross border, overcome bribery, etc. And turns out that we need Chipkamoy, um, hmm? Chip yes, got it right, <laughs> um, works as an organization who aims at helping building up the capacity of women, mainly in the rural sector, but still, Winnie, can you tell us more about um, yeah, how how you build their capacity and what you do for them. Okay, so uh, to introduce SNV, SNV is a non-for-profit international organization uh, we, uh, that is in 28 countries, uh, uh, initially from uh, The Hague, Netherlands, and in Kenya uh, for the past uh, 50 plus years. And uh, uh, our main projects are in agriculture, energy, and uh, water and sanitation, but then, we, uh, for the past 50 years, they've noticed there's a gap and, uh, uh, I mean, the issue of inclusion. And that is why they have the program for enhancing opportunities for women's enterprises. So we work in eight counties in Kenya and with, uh, seven provinces in Vietnam, uh, working with uh, women entrepreneurs in the rural setting. And uh, what we do, we use three components. That is uh, combining <coughs> policy advocacy to ensure that uh, there's an enabling environment for women uh, led businesses in the rural setting to, to, to grow. We also uh, have the aspect of enterprise development and we have the aspect of social transformation. This is where uh, the issue of workload time use, where uh, we, we work to have a dialogue, we use a household dialogue where the husband and the wife uh, dialogue about uh, time use, uh, workload, so that we see women having more time either to, to, to do business. How, how do you make that happen? I'm pretty sure many women would like to know how this dialogue <laughs> works. <in. laughs> yes, so in the eight counties, and it's working by the way, uh, we use household dialogue, so we have facilitators who carry decisions, and uh, our target is our, um, uh, uh, the, I mean a household, the, the husband has, has to be there. And uh, we take them through the dialogue, and in fact we have impact stories, and you you can check in our a website, uh, SNV World, where uh, the husband is helping the women, woman to, to, I mean, the wife to fetch water or, 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 or to, to, to take care of the children at home while she's going to the market. And, and with that, we now see the issue of capacity building, uh, skills development, because uh, we take them through our, uh, our skills on business development, and we also do market linkage. Uh, we work with the governments to ensure that we have uh, uh, the environment to, for access to credit. Access to credit for women entrepreneurs is still an issue for, I think, uh, in Kenya and, 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 and uh, the rest of the world. And 
also the aspect of leadership development so that not only these women can can uh, uh, do business make money or increase their income but also to be a leader they can speak and participate in public participation policy making processes and so forth so we, with that there's the issue of e-commerce SME does not ignore the fact that Africa is a vibrant uh, digital uh, uh, e e economy especially in Kenya and when you work working with the women uh, in the rural setting you realize that their business could be small but they doing um frequent transactions using mpesa and that in itself is 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 is, is e-commerce so in as much as as these women cannot read and write which i think it's an issue i'll come back to uh, later uh, uh at least we acknowledge the fact that mpesa has has the local content of it apart from being in English. And it's working and the, the, the businesses are growing. And we hope that uh, after 2020, where our program will be ending in Kenya, we'll have now the second uh, uh, aspect of, of fully integrating uh, 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 digital um, uh, uh, work in, in, in the program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Winnie. Please clap. Thank you. So in addition to this expert that we have, we also happen to have brilliant women entrepreneurs at this stage. And to, this is, uh, for example, just as Mohinika said, okay, we have like issues in the rural area, but it's also very exciting to see that you have African women succeeding in business, especially in the field of e-commerce industry. So I would love uh, for you, Catherine, and afterwards, uh, Nancy, to tell us Tell us your, your, your entrepreneurial journey, and yes. Um, so, I, I'm oh, so I'm Catherine, and um, I, I'm a software engineer by profession and a change maker by passion. So I uh, loved, <laughs> thank you, and um, I, I had a fascination of technology from a very young age, and due to that, or due, due to having a family that encouraged me to take part or pursue subjects or careers in the STEM um, fields, it now encouraged me to now pursue computer science at the University of Nairobi. So uh, with family uh, encouraging me, um, you know, with just uh, having a strong, uh, just strong background in regards to uh, technology, I have now used that to now become an entrepreneur and also try and bring change in uh, my society and also ensure that uh, women have a front seat at the table. So, um, uh, Pauli, do you want me to also talk about the success of my entrepreneurship journey or? Um, yes, 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 please, okay. please do. Maybe start by the challenges you have, you have uh, had to overcome. Okay, Please. yeah. So um, when I, I started my entrepreneurial journey in 2010, at that time I was still at the University of Nairobi and uh, with the love of uh, technology and, um, and gadgets, I now decided that also I wanted to become an entrepreneur and see what the, the world of um, IT or innovation, uh, uh, the world of IT and innovation um, had in store. So while I started my company in campus, I faced a lot of challenges. At that time, I was uh, in my final year project, I, a final year, and I was uh, working on my final year project. I received a lot of skepticism from students and lecturers. The reason being, I was the only student doing not only a software project, but also a hardware project. And as the only student out of 100 people doing that. But, uh, <laughs> so um, I think uh, your mindset plays a huge role because if I decided to follow what people told me and, told, uh, and you know, just told me like, why would you want to do that? You need to stay in the comfort zone and do something that um, you know, probably you're familiar with. But I you know, decided to follow my instinct and I said, you know what, I want to do this. It's a challenge and I'm willing to take up the challenge. And after the project, I was actually ranked as the best um, project to do in my final year. Um, then later when I was, <laughs> when, um, when also as when I was still doing my final year project, I was working on my startup. So I was trying to juggle my career and also trying to juggle uh, my studies at the same time. So three weeks shy of my final year exam, I was now traveling not only outside East Africa or Africa, but to the US to pitch 
for my company. Because at that time, there was, there was limited funding within the Kenyan ecosystem. So, um, you know, at that time, I was considered not focused. I need to finish education first. And that's what um, a lot of parents um, encourage their, their children, like, you know, focus on school, get employed with the, by the best company in your industry. And at that time, entrepreneurship was considered a high-risk career option. But, you know, I believed in my inner voice that told me I'm powerful beyond measure. And, and I've told the land that I've told the you know the land for my business for over eight years, and I'm happy with the fruits of my labor, and I've been able to get a lot of opportunity not only to uh, be a member of the Lioness of Africa, but they also invited me last year to talk about my journey and entrepreneurship and how to inspire the women in this industry. Wow! Thank you. Congratulations for that, Catherine. Thank you. We also have another brilliant entrepreneur, which is Nancy. Nancy runs a, a logistics company that works a lot with e-commerce company. And actually, um, logistics is one of the key pillars, if not the most important, of e-commerce. So I would love you to tell us how you managed to become an entrepreneur in the, probably the most complicated aspect of doing e-commerce and what have been your journey so far. So um, I started my business at the age of 22, and I was still in campus. My background is in media and communication, and right now I'm doing logistics. So when um, there's a time, how the idea came, there's a time I bought a TV online, and it took more than a week to be delivered. And then I was like, what is the radius of Nairobi, and no one is communicating to me? I think I can sort this out. Mm -hmm. So when I was starting my business, I had saved around um, 700 US. This. So I attended a forum, you know, like when you're still young and you attend these forums and you meet people. And one of the projects that they had was to help young people on motorbikes. And because I needed to to start my business, I gave out the money. And up to today, I've, I've never seen the motorbike. So which means I was swindled. Yeah. And that, you know, like um, when I was telling someone that they were like, you know what, that is now entrepreneurship. Yeah, you've just been ushered in. It was so painful, but I decided um, I'll pick myself up because that's what we do, and then I'll move on. So I started saving. I, do, I did some manual jobs, and um, I started my business officially in 2014, in December, and uh, fast forward right now, we have more than 15 permanent employees. And... Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I believe one of the challenges that I was facing as a young woman doing business is lack of mentorship because we all need mentors. We need people to hold our hands and tell us this is the way it goes because when we have mentors, it means these are people who have already maybe gone through the path and if I can learn through your mistakes, I shouldn't have to know, like, to go through the same. And another thing um, that I think women are lacking is lack of technical support and capacity building. Many a times people say funding is a big issue. Yes, it's a big issue, but you can't be given money and you don't know how to spend it. So I believe that's another challenge that women are facing. And logistics is not an easy field. It's one of the complicated fields. And I remember when I was starting and I was like, I want to do courier services, someone asked me, how are you going to do it with the big players in the industry? But I kept on saying that the cake is big. I'll just cut my piece. Please clap for that quote. Clap for that quote. Yeah, so like um, speaking as an entrepreneur in the e-commerce space and someone who, you know, um, challenges and there. And one of the challenges that I'm facing as someone who's doing logistics is the public address system. We really don't have good, you know, like address system. So at times you want to deliver and it really takes a lot for you to get to the client because we do last mile delivery. So which means we deliver to homes and we also deliver to offices. At times the client herself or himself are even finding it hard to direct the rider to their own place. So how do we handle this? We've tried to, you know, like we try to use the 
POI, which is the point of interest. So we ask you maybe which is the nearest mall that you're close to. But then again, you'll find that someone is telling you a mall that's very far from where they are. And this means that we really waste a lot of time on the road. So we can promise you two hours, but, the, but by the time the rider, you know, like, um, meets with the client, it's really a lot of time, you know, like wasted on the road. And I also think um, another challenge that we're facing is uh, payment. You know, like Africans, uh, we still believe that <laughs> we still believe that money is money when you've seen it. You know, like when you've seen it with your own eyes. Eh? So that's, <laughs> that's another challenge that uh, we are also facing. And I remember this story of a guy who went to the ATM machine and withdrew all his money and then went to the bank and was like, I want my money here. Outside it will be stolen, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, and then we also have mistrust because uh, uh, clients are like, I'm not really... Uh, paying in advance, I have to see the item. So this makes us as uh, people who are doing last mile delivery to be like the agents because it means the client is not trusting the seller and the seller is not trusting the, uh, the client. So we have to come in between and make sure the transaction is done. So I think that we still have mistrust of, um, you know, like guys who are buying online and also I think I it has something to do with policy because we don't have the necessary measures to protect both the buyers and the sellers. So I think um, uh, like how we can sort this out is uh, have like consumer education. Up to now, I still have an aunt who doesn't know what I do. I try to explain to her and she believes that I sell motorbikes. <laughs> so I just run with that, you know, we, yeah, with her narrative. And then... Um, technology sharing, we don't really have data that is being shared. And then, like I mentioned, the enterprise capacity building for women, institutional capacity, and then in a, um, the internet penetration, like even in Kenya, yeah, we're doing so well, but not really good because, because we have some parts which the internet is not accessible. And when we're speaking about e-commerce, e-commerce is equal to internet. Yeah, but um, having said that, I believe that the internet is an equalizer, and as women, we don't really have an excuse because you can even sell at the comfort of your sitting room. Yeah, and what we also do at Dana, we provide storage space because we understand there are people who don't have physical shops. So we provide storage uh, space, and even if you're selling from your house, you can always pick it from there and um, deliver it. And we also have like pick up and drop off point. So really we don't have an excuse as women because we can even penetrate other markets. And I always say as Africans, instead of thinking of how you're going to import your stuff to Kenya, why don't you also think about how we're going to penetrate other markets even outside Africa? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, so, Isabelle, um, regard de, de Given the diversity of um, backgrounds and perspectives, what do you think that we could do or could be done? Because we've talked a lot about uh, monitoring and networking and all that. How could we move on to facilitate uh, the work of women entrepreneurs who find themselves uh, left with their own devices. First of all, thank you both. I think your stories are very telling. You're already somewhere, uh, somehow mentors in your own right. Uh, it's not always been easy, of course. But uh, at Angta, what we would want to do and what we're going to undertake with the support of uh, Netherlands, I would like to thank them. I'd like to come to what the representative of EU said, is to highlight all these positive stories. And it's Madame Monica who said that we needed positive stories and women are there, they have those stories. We don't even need to invent them, they are there. So to highlight a real network of women who have uh, succeeded uh, that can inspire others, it's not contradictory uh, to what is already being done by ICT, talking about she trade, a network of women traders, uh, 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 and that they share information. Here, the idea is to set up 
a network which demonstrates positive examples uh, could call them lionesses or anything else or images that uh, uh, catch the attention of people show that uh, examples are there for small uh, enterprises uh, the big ones in technology women are doing it and i think that is an instrument that could contribute to highlight the success of women uh, other than in areas like agriculture or in formal sector or in the markets with all due respect to them of course but to stimulate other women to bring this image of a woman entrepreneur in uh, technology engineering uh, who are able to set up businesses the second thing that i wanted to add and i think it's nancy who talked uh, who went through empretech uh, program that we've been supporting uh, for several years in different countries which contrary to other countries uh, is working for six days with men and women especially women not uh, uh, only how to do business plan that can come later but how do you build self confidence how do you build a network because we are ready to say that isolated women would not make it they would not have the staying power uh, they'll burn out so this uh, empetrek when i meet them in kenya and other countries those who come out of it are empetrekers uh, they are women who network with others and bring their enthusiasm and also they share difficulties that can they can meet and uh, that is something irreplaceable so that is a program that we can grow a uh, leverage center and lastly i wanted to say something about statistics because i think disaggregated uh, data is very important but collecting them is not very easy because we're talking about trade and gender whether it's e-commerce or normal uh, trade we need to see what we're measuring are we measuring the end result or the the uh, turnover it's an ind an indicator that it cannot capture the gender gap because because uh, trade influences uh, uh, gender and gender influences trade so we should be very um uh, sophisticated to see how we can use data to uh, demonstrate uh, how women are getting involved in um, uh, economy and also in e-commerce so we should be very sophisticated in how we m construct uh, uh, statistical models uh, we cannot measure things that we don't know what we're going to do with so that sh should actually help us to know how to change uh, policies uh, trade and uh, finance access policies so that we can see how many women are participating so we should exchange a lot not only on statistical collection but what statistics do we need quantitative and also quant qualitative data and qualitative data is very important because um mass of statistics is not important we need both qualitative and quantitative data uh, so that we can get necessary tools it is not the most sexy part because statistics is considered uh, something a bit boring but without statistics we cannot measure progress so it's a, some work that should be done but what is more exciting is a mentorship uh, highlighting uh, the passion of those who are working uh, and who are the ambassadors uh, who are the most um, inspiring people who can inspire others thank you indeed it is important to measure uh, the work uh, the success to see how we can effectively influence policies and um, talking about policy I, I i know that there are several initiatives that have been started in kenya even beyond e-commerce beyond trade to help you know, bridge the gap of women involvement um, in the economic life. Can you share with us um, an example, one or two examples that maybe other African countries could learn on and uh, from and, and replicate? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I think for those of you in Kenya, um, you know about the 30% government uh, affirmative procurement, and this means that uh, all the tenders and contracts that government is um, sourcing, 
30% has been reserved for women, youth, and persons with disability. Um, and this is really an excellent measure. It's, it's an act of, uh, of law. Uh, it's no longer just a regulation, and it's a really good measure to equalize also in terms of how women participate in these spaces, and also young women as youth. Uh, because women are not homogeneous in that sense. Mm -hmm. And what this also does is that, um, because uh, here Monica was talking about the Mama Bogas, it really lifts women and empowers them to really create wealth. And at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want to move women from subsist subsistence farming to wealth creation. And it's only when they are creating the wealth will they be able to become real, uh, you know, enterprising machineries, you know, and, and even enter sectors, uh, you know, in, in manufacturing and beyond. So uh, this is one really good example that we hope other countries will also take, uh, take up. I know countries like South Africa, uh, even Nigeria are trying to do similar interventions, uh, but, but I think Kenya has gone quite a bit in this. Then the other one is also we need to remind ourselves that the skill sets in this digital era keep changing. And, and for women, it is important to be abreast with what level of capacities are needed to be then included. Because it's one thing to have an enabling environment, but it's another thing, like as mentioned before, if you don't have the right capacities as an individual or as a group, then it's as good as not you know, being able to enter in that space. So um, the, also the notion that whether it's you know, private uh, sector or public sector to make deliberate efforts to create platforms where women can really uh, regularly update their own skills in terms of what it means, whether it's digital inclusion or other areas, is also something that needs to be taken into account. Because if you are not deliberate about these things and focused, then you will leave those who are marginalized behind. And, and that is what we are not trying to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zabib. Um, Alessandro, by any chance, do you have uh, any example of initiative, whether it's in Africa or in Europe or beyond, that you think can, we can in, be inspired by? by? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, first, something I was uh, thinking while listening to my, my co-panelists. In my, my direct boss in Brussels, uh, the head of the, my unit, the unit dealing with, uh, with Africa, is a woman. Um, the next level, the director, that is to say dealing with an entire directorate, is a woman. The deputy director general in my department uh, is a woman. There is only the director general, who is a man, but is retiring soon. So at some point, <laughs> I think, uh, this just to say that uh, things change. Uh, my department, uh, I mean, DigiTrade is the department dealing with the international negotiations. Uh, um, and uh, it's always been considered, uh, well, quite, quite a tough one, okay? And, uh, well, it's now evident that, uh, well, women are in control. We have two deputy director general, they're both women. I mean, just to give the idea that uh, on the policy side, uh, the more uh, on the policy uh, uh, design, etc., the more you will have a sufficient number of women uh, at the top or in the, the, the medium uh, cadre, uh, well, you will have always the gender, the women dimension always considered by, by default. I mean, it's something good, but just to say that uh, things change, there is uh, the space. Uh, it's also true that one has to, 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 want, one has to really be willing to conquer this space. I mean, it's, it's really, it's there. And then when women decide to conquer the space, well, they, they get it. So <laughs> this is just, just from um, my, 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 my personal experience. Uh, yeah, success stories. Again, I mentioned, I mentioned policy. Uh, one thing that we have uh, clearly understood is that uh, when we decide uh, to tackle problems, uh, digital divide, uh, else, uh, it's clear that if we don't put together, if we don't gather together, gather pri private and public sector, we are not going very far. Um, the, the, the different mindsets uh, are really different. Mm -hmm. They perceive uh, different problems. They see uh, situations in different way. It's only when you have uh, around the same table people belonging uh, to different groups uh, 
that you can hope, it's not necessarily always the case, but you can hope to be able to identify in the end uh, the real problems and the solutions which are practical and that are not just only theoretical, but that can be also applied uh, in, daily, uh, in daily life. So I would say first thing, uh, uh, public and, uh, and private uh, from uh, policy design uh, point of view. We have, uh, in the case of Europe, uh, the examples of a, a platform we call multi-stakeholders platform, especially in the digital uh, area. Uh, where again, you have a time and a place for the women who work in this sector, uh, again, to exchange information, to be up to date, to know what's going on, to know what are the, I mean, the latest developments, uh, where to focus, where to spend time and money, uh, uh, and sometimes just how to, not to waste uh, time, uh, time and money. So, uh, private public, uh, multi-stakeholders uh, uh, platform, uh, um, all this, uh, uh, of course, uh, requires, uh, well, that's, that's to me kind of bottom line, uh, uh, that from a cultural point of view, uh, of course, uh, the usual stereotypes, they have already been mentioned, uh, are attacked uh, frontally. Uh, well, of course, there is no reason why uh, young girls should not study uh, science, art, science, uh, maths, uh, engineering, or uh, whatever. We have here fantastic, fantastic examples uh, of how it can work well. Uh, so, uh, attacking stereotypes, uh, um, which has one positive implication in the medium long term, which is uh, to favor a sufficient number of role models. Because it's only when you have a sufficient number of girls studying, for example, in engineering, engineering departments, that you can hope to have, well, not just one lioness, but lots of lionesses around. So um, I think that we have mentioned quite a number of different types of barriers in the regulatory areas, in the access, whether to credit, to finance, uh, uh, to uh, trade-related information. Um, we have mentioned uh, uh, the collection of data, the collection, I mean, the, the, the establishment of uh, networking, uh, networking solutions. Uh, all these things should be considered. I mean, it's difficult to say that one is more important than the others. It depends on many factors, the situation, uh, the country, the culture, um, but should, should really be, um, I think, uh, taken on board uh, um, at the same time. Uh, and uh, in a in massive and substantive way. Uh, in a sense, I think it's really breaking a ceiling. You have really to give, a, I think, a big push at the beginning to, I mean, really to, uh, to get through the door, whatever the way. And then once you are on the other side, you'll see uh, that there are lots of opportunities that you, before, uh, you, I mean, that everybody would have not even uh, uh, even, uh, even uh, considered. So, uh, we are talking about uh, e-commerce, uh, digital divide. Uh, again, it's not necessarily uh, always and everywhere the first problem. As we have seen, I mean, there are uh, even more basic. The digital is one aspect of, of, uh, of more, uh, of more uh, basic and, uh, and, and, and structural and, uh, and structural issues. And on our side, on the side of uh, uh, international donors or policymakers, uh, in the case of policymakers, uh, um, we have understood that, uh, well, mainstreaming this issue is, is what matters. For example, in the case of the European Union now, our digital for development uh, strategy is a way to try to mainstreaming the gender dimension ac across all our uh, cooperation initiatives of the European Union. Because if you think the money that the European Union has invested over a few decades on cooperation to development, it's, I mean, really, we are talking about uh, dozens of billions of euros, dollars, uh, and the, the, the percentage of this money which has been invested directly in the digital economy area is really uh, not enough. This we have clearly understood, also because we have less money. <laughs> These days, uh, it's about uh, using the money in the best uh, effect, the most effective and efficient way. Um, so, uh, mainstreaming, uh, each time uh, um, when it's about a policy asking uh, 
what would be the implications, the, the consequences, the, what would be the impact uh, on certain groups, it can be women, youth, uh, people with disabilities, uh, the impact, uh, and even when it's not possible or it's not practical or whatever the reason to have specific provisions tackling specifically uh, these groups, uh, it's always important to take into account what the impact would be and what the, the gaps, the existing gaps are. So that whatever, I mean, the action, uh, it's not something that runs against, uh, uh, I mean, really, reality. Sometimes, uh, if you don't know how the, the problem is uh, actually uh, in reality, you are maybe uh, investing money in uh, activities or programs, projects, which will not achieve uh, um, the, right, the, right, uh, the right result. So I think whenever we have a project, a program, whenever international donors um, uh, decide to implement uh, uh, an initiative, uh, most of times, uh, if you have a success, if you can really, in the end, uh, find that something has really worked, uh, usually it's because of one of these factors has played uh, a very important role. It's because either you have networked uh, or because you have, uh, yes, provided mentorship, uh, and I'm talking mentorship to thousands uh, of women, because this, I mean, what some programs are about. It's not just about uh, selecting uh, uh, the best and the brightest. We, we are talking about really uh, entering the market uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a massive way. So success stories usually are based on uh, a careful consideration of uh, these, these aspects. When, s some, when one of these aspects is completely left out uh, of uh, the de policy design uh, exercise, uh, well, uh, the investment will not be effective and efficient. Thanks. Definitely. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, Nena, talking about uh, policy, uh, as we already said, it's very important to have like, the right data to be able to share what progress has been made or what progress need, uh, needs to happen. Uh, that being said, I, we have, on, we have it's clear uh, from our conversation that uh, there is still a huge data gap uh, because the right statistical framework are not in place. What advice could you give us um, or what recommendation could you give to build better uh, statistical framework based, uh, for gender-based policy uh, assessment in Africa? Thank you. If you permit me, I would like to speak to everyone listening to me as a mentor. Mm -hmm. But I'll answer your question first. It is very important that we see the digital part of our economy as, as something very important. Uh, for, for some of our countries, we still don't have the clear policy about a digital um, country. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't know whether it's, when you're talking to people about t connectivity, they are talking to you about Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. It's not a social media thing. It's an economic livelihood issue. Mm -hmm. Somebody like me, were it not for the internet, I wouldn't have a livelihood. Okay, so it needs to be put in the right policy framework and we need to understand the role that statistics and data play around it and then give it the necessary policy, budgetary and, and implementation um, drive. Now I'm going to stand up and speak for myself to the ladies listening to me <coughs> and also remove my shoes. <coughs> we That's where you know it's serious. The idea of husband from the life of a woman. Anytime someone is talking about an African woman, they're talking about her parents, they're talking about her husband, why? Can't you be your own human being? Like, you can go to the moon, you can do many things, you can be a doctor, but are you married? And how many children do you have? As if that is the measure of a woman's life. It is not. Calm down, calm down. Please, beauty is something that passes. You need to cultivate efficiency. When a client gives you a job, you need to do it and do it very well. You need to treat your client so well that wherever he goes, he will remember you. You know, when you give good service, customers will follow you. So let's not aim to be beautiful. Let's aim to be efficient. And when, I mean, by the time 
you begin to render services, people will forget you're a woman. They'll be like, ah, it comes from there. Just, just give me the service. That's the person you need. Grow a thick skin. I've led foundations in Africa. I've built movements. And people have called me Margaret Thatcher. They've called me Hitler woman. They've called me all kinds of names. I'm like, I'm still here. You have to deal with me. You know, you, somebody walks into my office and says he wants to see the boss. I'm like, I'm the boss. Okay. Deal with it. Okay? You need to grow thick skin. You do things, the same thing you do with a guy. Someone will say congratulations to the guy. And the late, other ladies even will say, so who did you sleep with to get there? I didn't sleep with anybody. I merited it. And we need to move from the fact that they are helping women. Every time we talk about women and economy, women need to be helped. Women need to be supported. It's your right. The budget of Kenya belongs to all Kenyans, men and women. It's your right. You should ask and request it. Why? Why will we live in a world of men where we are more than them? Bridget. It's your right. And please, with all respect to people, women need to talk business. E-commerce is commerce. E-business is business. Don't think that people will be soft on you. Hey, hey, sister, wake up. Dress up. I always have a pair of slippers and then the shoes. Eh? You can have a pair of baskets and the, the, point, the heel shoes. When it is hot, you, you change your shoes because you, you know where you are going to, right? And when it is time to put on lipstick, put on perfume, and put on the high heels, you also do that one. But you have an aim and you are in business. Lastly, we need African women to make money. Yes. To make bad money. That is real hard money. You see all these buildings in Nairobi. Who owns them? Men. Why won't you own your own? So every time we have money, they are telling us, hey, so I can take care of your family. The small money you make, village people will come. This person is sick. This, the man will say, I don't, it's my business. Um, I don't have money. But the woman will be like, hey, let me just give him 1,000. Let me just give him 2,000. By the time you know it, family has finished your money. So you need to really tell people, this is my business. And aim, I'm telling you, aim to be rich. If you don't have an aim to make money, you are not going to make money. Because you are not driving for it. Finally, you need to talk hard to people. The first time I gave someone a $15,000 bill for training, he's like, what is a small girl like you going to do with $15,000? I'm like, okay, pay first. And most people don't want to pay us. When we finish working for them, we do all the work, we do it well. And then they're like, paying you smart, and you should be okay with that. Sue them! <laughs> Sue them and let them know you are, you are... How many of you have sued someone, taken someone to court? You need to begin to sue people so they respect you. Because if you don't take yourself seriously, nobody will. Thank you very much. Can we say uh, Nena for president? We are not from the same country, but I'm voting. <laughs> wow. Where do we go from here? I mean, there are so much true. Oh, there is a hand raised back there. You seem passionate, so I want to hear what you have to say. Tell us, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Otieno, Maurice Otieno Rege. I'm from Kenya. I think that's a very important contribution on these women issues. Um, I'm a father of two girls, and I'm very passionate about their future and their progress. If you look at my notebook here, of all the presentations, what I've underlined are two things. We need a champion and we need passion, actually to drive women things. And to me, that lady is one champion. And I'm not, and I'm not just talking about Kenya. I have the privilege of having worked in a number of countries, including Germany, China, Italy, Spain, South Korea in Yosu, and Astana in Kazakhstan. And if you look at the distribution of men and women in high positions and the private sector, the difference is minimal. And that way, I would not say Kenya or any other African country that is doing badly. I think this thing about uh, gender is a recent thing. Even if you look at the British Parliament, look at it in the evening in the CNN when they're discussing Brexit, and you can see the number of men there. If you look at the US, if you look at Japan, it's a male-dominated world. But if you look at 
in terms of management of resources, the woman is number one. The best country on this is Japan, where the man earns his salary and brings it to the woman to manage all the family issues, and they are doing very well. What I think is we also must have a demonstration. There must be a demonstration effect. The passionate women must show that there's a woman engineer here. There is a, a software engineer woman here. There's a, a, a financial, a chartered financial accountant or something. Let us demonstrate that it can be done. Now, the other thing is on policy. In Kenya, we've talked about the one third or 30% or two thirds, yeah? We're trying to push women. And if you look at our parliament, there are lots of women and intelligent women. But if you don't have passion, there's nowhere you can take the women. Because you see, if you look at the, the finance, access to finance, for example, we need special regulations, special laws to enable women to access finance, for example, for trade or for business, for, for, or for international trade, for export, for that matter. Long time ago, a woman could not even uh, open an account without her husband or get a loan without her husband. That is complete rubbish. And you need people, these ladies in parliament, if they have passion to change the regulations to suit the women. The other thing is, what kind of model are you talking about when you're talking about women in business? For example, that entrepreneur at the corner there will get married, what this lady has raised up, and the husband will say, no, you can't continue this business. There's no succession. That business will die. And that's how sometimes the man or the married thing impacts on the woman's business or the beauty thing because of the culture, the, mm -hmm. the effects and the influences of culture affects women in business. But I can tell you the best manager, the best entrepreneur globally actually is the woman. But Thank if you, you look sir. at the map of the world, be it US, be it Germany, be it mm -hmm. where, still the woman has a long way to go. Germany is led by a very tough lady. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the industry, there are several tough ladies, but it's still increasing, mm -hmm. it's still growing. It's mm -hmm. not at the peak where we expect it. I think that lady is actually a champion. We need passion, Thank and women so are very, very critical. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very rich con um, contribution. Okay, uh, so thank you for that very rich uh, uh, competition and its uh, contribution. And it's very true that um, representation matters. And beyond uh, the mentoring uh, of women in business, etc., it's also very important that women get more seat at the table of decision making, whether it's in business or in policy. And talking about that, um, Monica, you are very passionate about those issues, policy making and management. So, do you have a word about it? Well, and then we open the floor to questions. I think first and foremost, um, the question is always, how are the men participating in making sure women are part of the table? I think we always think it's woman to woman. And I disagree with that. I think men are part and parcel of making sure women are at the table. I'm at this table because a man in the ICT sector who's probably going to be here tomorrow, Dr. Tim Kelly, invited me to the table. A British American, you know, World Bank who said, Monica, I'd like you to come into the table. It's a man who put me there on the table and then allowed me to be part of it. I think many times as men, we, say, we are looking to the women. I'm, I'm speaking to the men in the room and any other man out there, and I'm saying, as men, what are you doing to be ensuring that your women, your children, and the women around you are part of the table? Are you giving them space? Are you mentoring them to be in the boardroom? Are you mentoring them to, 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 to trade in business and in tax? Are you mentoring them to be part of that table? Or are we looking and saying we've put women in parliament so women should speak for us? We are not refusing women to speak, but we are saying also men should speak. And I thank the man in the, t in the room that's speaking for us here on this platform. Then uh, the second thing I'd like to say for policy is um, I think have been said by everyone. So I want, I'd, I'd like to stop there first and allow the floor to, to speak because I think it's important that they speak and then allow us to speak after. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Aisha, one quick word? Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. Actually, I want to talk about my personal experience as belonging to an organization in which I am the only active woman working in ICT since now years. So I can tell you that there is too much to be done in this regard. And um, adding to that, we have, um, we have organized a competition, a mobile app competition about, related to e-commerce. And uh, ironically, we received 50 uh, applications and uh, we selected 20 applications, but were all, uh, all male participants. So that's why our organization decided to take the lead in, in empowering women, and we are organizing the next edition exclusively women and girl competition in mobile applications. So I wanted to, to say and to, uh, to thank the president also for the organi for, of, our, of my organization who gave me the floor and who gave me his place to talk about women and contribute and uh, voice. Uh, if we do not work hard, we can't, we can't achieve success. I mean, uh, if you want to be a success story, you need to work hard, you need to meet challenges, and you need to, to, to raise your voice to, um, to, grasp, to grasp the opportunity because decision-making is not that easy. Uh, decision-making position is not that easy also to get. So we need to fight uh, hard to get it and, uh, and empower, empower women. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that example. Uh, add one thing. If men in board of company, uh, in parliament, everywhere, could say, I will not participate if there is not gender balance, and I refuse to participate, or to be member, or to do something, or to speak, I think that we have a common responsibility. It's good to say, yes, women have to be passionate, and I thank you for your patience because it's very useful, but it's not enough. I think that the patient has to come also from men, saying, okay, it's not, no more possible to go like that, and I will not participate to this meeting, to this board, to this uh, decision-making, without a balance with women in the room in order to make the decision. If it was like that, I think that probably we, we, we have not to be here next year to discuss about uh, women in technology and uh, in the political life. Absolutely, and that is very true. And, and thank you, um, uh, Aisha, for sharing that example. I mean, she's the living proof, uh, the living example of a man who literally give a seat at this table to a woman. So <laughs> let's clap for a boss. <laughs> Even though he's not here, his name is Cissé. Um, and definitely, it's very important that whether we are men or women, but especially for men, we to have in mind why it's important to have gender equality of, or better gender balance in organization because ultimately, whether it's in government or in business, we are serving a diverse crowd. Our customers are men, our women, our users, our voters are men or women. But if we keep having homogeneous spaces, we ultimately it's not going to work. And I, our guests perfectly and wonderfully uh, illustrated that. So the floor was... oh. Enthusiasm. The floor is open to questions. So, the lady in yellow over there, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. My name is Lavina. I'm, I'm from Kenya. My question is to the ladies. Um, many a times you're told we are our own worst enemies. What are we doing about it? Because I believe most of you who are managers or are in the top leadership, how many of you take initiative to take someone as a woman below you and take him up? Or are we choosing the men, for example, in an ICT company or in any company that you belong to, how many of you people believe that an, a software engineer can be a woman? Um, how are we not I, being our own worst enemies? And how can we deal with that? So your question is, what are we doing? All right. So uh, do I, I want two women. To, 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 to answer the question, Aisha, please. Yes, I think the key, the key here is, um, is to invest in education because if women are not in ICT field or e-commerce field, that comes from them. So we need to educate them first and to make them aware of the role they, are, they can play and then um, include uh, ICT teaching in, in, in schedule and official programs and train them little by little to, 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 be, in, to be involved. I mean, it, it, never, it will not just come uh, 
all at once. It will be, it will be taking steps and, um, uh, to be achieved. Uh, that's to say, women should be trained first to, uh, to participate, and then we will ask them uh, more responsibilities to, uh, to have. I hope. To add to that, just for because she's asking from Kenya, I'd like to give an example of some woman who's, there are many women trying to do something. Um, Florence, Florence, you all know, if you know her, Florence Mutahi. Yeah. And the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, she's the chair lady of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, as she said, I think she still is, um, or just stepped down her term. And what she did as the chair lady of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers is that she began a project to highlight the top women in Kenya in manufacturing. And if you go to WW Hapa Kenya, you will find the top 15 women in manufacturing showcased what they do, how they're doing it, and it's amazing work. Women who are selling beer and a big, big beer companies, big um, tea companies, and these are run by women. And the, the website starts by, did you know that it's women who actually are doing this? So what we're saying is women on the table, when you have a sit on the table, showcase the other women on the table. Florence Mutahi is an example of someone who's done that in Kenya in, her, in the League of Manufacturing, showcasing women who are doing manufacturing and e-commerce in terms of trade and business and showcasing them. And I just wanted to give, highlight that example. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. Uh, sir, uh, in the back, yes, you. Mm -hmm. I will speak in, uh, in French. Is it possible? Uh, of course, there is trans yeah, yeah, la traduction, donc vous pouvez. There is translation, so you can. D'accord. Very well. I'm Onte Moussibobo from Burkina Faso. I would like to share our experience in terms of the empowerment of women in Burkina Faso. Now, it needs to be said that we have the director of e-commerce present here. She is here. But she's a little bit shy. She's here, here, yes, right next to me. She's a little bit shy. She doesn't want to take the microphone, but it's not a problem. She is the director of e-commerce in our country, and she fights to ensure that e-commerce includes the empowerment of women in our country. Even the Ministry of Economic Development and Digital Development is currently led by a woman. I wanted to add something else. Now, truth be told, I believe that the issue of gender can be resolved organically. Just like the lady from Kenya just told us, as long as women believe in themselves. So I also teach in a small university and I've noticed one thing. I teach uh, software development and so forth and what I noticed is that girls, girls are often more studious, more attentive, better when it comes to the development of new software and applications than men. I don't say this lightly, it's something I have noticed. But unfortunately, after they leave the university, they seem to sort of close in on themselves and they simply don't go out there and use their skills. Just last month, I was asked to train 30 young girls uh, on the topic of e-commerce and I noted that some of them were programmers, coders. But I just don't know. I just don't know what, what is going on, what's happening. I was trying to tell them that you have the keys to the world in your hands. I'm from a family where there are three girls, and between me and the last one, there are 16 years. And these sisters of mine have made me in the man I am. And I know that I believe one thing. Development will happen as soon as women get involved. Could we perhaps uh, see each other a little bit later? I'd like to get your business card and just to know what you're doing in terms of e-commerce. Of, uh, as we say, uh, yeah, a man actually using his voice for women and empowerment. So we can clap for that. I love that. Yes. Okay, uh, the sir with the green green shirt. Mm -hmm. And then I'm good. Yes, you. And then you'll be you. Thanks, Candice. My name is Remy Mweke. Uh, I work with Digital Sense Africa, based off Lagos. And uh, Digital Sense Africa, as a matter of fact, is led by a woman for the past 10 years. And good thing about it is that um, <clears throat> we have continuously progressed, even before I joined them. 
And I'm sure Nena will not remember that she was part of the inspiration that put this sense where it is today. So I wish to thank you for that. Um, secondly, is that um, education is very, very important. Yes, we may be educated as we are here today, but in our individual homes, how are we rating our younger ones, the boys and the girls? When the boys ordinarily would like to intimidate their younger girls, do you try to caution them? It's part of education. It's not only about what they taught them in schools. So even we as parents need also to take responsibility because most of these things are culturally embedded and we need to start changing them by talking to our children the right way, bringing two of them to the same table, giving them the same opportunity in our own little boardrooms and not waiting until they graduate and then getting out of the school and then entering the society to start experiencing that everyone should be given equal opportunity. That's we need so to grow from that. I'd like thank to, you thank very you. much. Yeah, I'd uh, like to just please uh, do, Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very true that you know culture and uh, the society plays a huge role in defining the uh, role of the woman. So in, traditionally, she's seen as you know a person who should, who should take care of the home, and that undermines her role in the business. So as catalyst of economic growth, as an entrepreneur, uh, I've taken steps as just you know being a woman, being a female founder and running a company to have mandates in the company, not only to work with um, uh, women-led coffee far uh, farmers, but also ensuring that a number of women are hired at the position of uh, you know, policy making and also decision making. Because you need to change the narrative of a woman who is just a caretaker to the narrative of, of a woman being bold, she's strong, she's a leader, and she also deserves a seat at the table. To give my personal experience, uh, my family consider, uh, some of my family members consider me as, you know, in quotes, bossy. Because I, I am unapologetic when I go for my dreams. I'm unapologetic when I um, you know, want to have a voice and ensure that it's heard. And for me, I've just decided that I'm on a journey and my journey is a one-way express train. And it's only moving forward. So it's either you join me or catch the next train. And for me, that has really helped me move forward and have a very set mindset on what I want to achieve. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Madam? Please, and just let's, let's make sure that we ask questions to be able to bring, to, to give the, the ability to the parent to bring value with their expertise. Since they, are, since they are here, we may as well use them. And then I will come back to you, sorry, because I wanted to give the voice to a woman, but please. Yes. Okay, merci. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll speak French, please. Yes, I've put my headset, well actually you have your headset on and I'd prefer to speak French. My name is Martin Fernand, I'm from Burundi. Now, when we refer to e-commerce involving women, I believe that it is an extremely important topic. Even though I have seen that the statements and comments have to some extent shown that there is a sort of a, a female revolution underway here because e-commerce in Africa is something which will mostly help uh, those more precarious uh, groups amongst the population, rural producers and so forth, who lack that in-depth access to the markets, small traders and so forth. And if we refer to these groups of the population, you will see that the strongest actors, the strongest drivers are women and youth. Yes, correct, says the moderator, and it's connected to what Catherine says. When it comes to uh, very often one sells online uh, coffee and jewelry and so forth. So these are not major forms of activity and so forth. But you have a question because this is what we're looking for. No, no, I don't have any questions. It was a contribution. Now, just to save time, could you perhaps summarize Absolutely, Madam Moderator, I'm going to go for gold now. Why must we always refer to specificities when we discuss women? This is a question. I would like to see women themselves 
commit themselves and take advantage of the opportunities afforded by e-commerce to women, especially to these, uh, to these groups, because e-trade and e-commerce, you know that there are always constraints on business. The initial capital, when one has no initial capital for investment, well, then you simply cannot produce, you cannot export, you cannot participate actively in trans-border trade. But with e-commerce now, everyone will have an opportunity to access all markets and to be able to buy and sell easily. Absolutely right, says the moderator, and this is why we want to see more equality for e-commerce, to have it serve as a tool a tool to level out the playing field. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. I too will speak French because I am better in French. My name is Safim Yamadam Moussouf. I'm from Chad. I'm a member of civil society. Now, I wanted to convey my gratitude to all of the panelists for the outstanding feedback they shared with us. I would like to say regarding the role that we play as civil society. We train, we train young girls in the fields of coding and just the digital sphere more general, generally speaking. And we have understood that the question which is of principal importance here is that of trust in oneself, confidence in oneself. And this has enabled us to look at developing, developing programs or software which is tailored to these girls. Now, the issue of personal development is very important. It enables young girls to enjoy greater tr trust, confidence in themselves regarding where they want to go in life. And also, over and beyond, just trust in oneself and confidence in oneself. There's an aspect which is very important. When girls are trained, they are then on the market and then they are exposed. And when they're exposed, they should be in a position to move forward alone, to defend themselves, to be independent, to independent and to play their role and to participate fully in the marketplace that they find themselves in. But right now, most of these girls are not able to do this. These capabilities are not ones which one acquire during the any training that takes place in university or when one is mentored because, of course, there are limits to what we can do. We simply don't have sufficient resources available to us to provide them with all the tools and all the knowledge that is required. So what I would say is that one should here stress the very important role played by civil society when it comes to capacity building. The important role played by civil society when it comes to advocacy. Advocacy for gender equality. One also needs to refer and note that at times we lack resources. We, we face a shortage of resources to tackle all this. I can give you an example. The moderator says, perhaps we won't go into the examples because it is important to have questions posed to the panel. I'll get, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. In 11 Francophone countries, we have a women's digital network for development. And every year, we organize training sessions for young girls in the field of programming, coding. Burkina Faso, he said it, has already carried out this training course in the field of e-commerce. And coming behind this, we then have uh, sessions to improve uh, these girls' abilities to ensure that they are able to participate actively beyond Africa's borders. Now, I wanted to call, and I called for this this morning, please focus specifically when you're referring to capacity building, focus on civil society. Thank you. Thank you, says the moderator. Thank you for your contribution. I'm going to say this in French, and I'll say it in English as well. It's important that now we have to put questions to the panel. Once all the questions that they could possibly have answered to have been asked, then we can make other forms of contributions. We're not always so fortunate to have individuals of such high caliber here around the same table in Nairobi, in Kenya. Let's take advantage of it.
Uh, so any question for the panel member, sir? Uh, thank you, moderator. I'm Jaco Tieno from Kenya. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a question within the ICT perspective and the organization, the Winnie department. Oh, Kenya, for example, is a, a broader aspect of agriculture since we still have a very uh, wider land, land of coverage. How is the ICT aspect bringing a machine inclusion into the agricultural sector, set up instead of manpower, the use of horse and those small plows. On your intervention through the cultural conflicts and uh, within the diversity circle, how do you address the religious circle, or religion, religion and uh, cultural barriers within the society in perspective to Kenya? Is your question addressed to someone in particular? Yeah, the first question has been addressed to the ICT platform, which is a software developer and uh, the ICT consultant. Catherine, you want to address that? Um, um, so, so, I thank you. So uh, in regards to like working in the agricultural sector, um, one of the um, research that I found out as when I was doing um, my mentorship around the country. So I've, I'm actually one of the Safaricom uh, mentors. And during that time, I realized that the business ventures in Nairobi are at a different scale with business ventures in uh, the rural areas. So the people who are doing their pitching, um, the quality is not as, as high as the one in Nairobi. So due to that, I decided that I want to venture into a business that targets the rural farmers or um, you know, the rural economy. Based on the Kenyan statistics, 40% of the, um, uh, in, in agriculture, 40% of people work in this sector and 70% of the rural people work in the in the um, rural people work in the economy sector of the agriculture and one of the challenges that I've realized is that yes we may have easy access to the mobile phones or smartphones however it's very difficult to apply uh, mobile application in the rural areas. So right now for my company, what I'm doing is, um, you know, doing training in regards to the digital economy, um, trying not only to just train the farmers who are, you know, the age between of, you know, 50 to 60, but also training their children so that they can have an uptake in the digital economy. Um, and um, also using my platform to now ensure that they're able to have a visible um, ensure that they also have a visibility not only in Kenya but also uh, at the world. So talking about their, their you know, farms, talking about um, their story is how I've been able to do it. I feel there's still a lot to be done, uh, not only in um, just in Nairobi but also in the rural areas. So that's the first step that I'm working on before now I go to the next step in regards to the just empowering their digital um, capabilities. Thank you very much. Uh, please go. Well, thank you very much. My name is Njeri. Uh, represent Beautiful Minds Organization. So my question is on the consumer perspective. Most of the women who are are consumers of the digital era, are the ones who are caregivers. And I'm speaking about caregivers because uh, our organization talks about mental health. And you know, women are the ones who carry the biggest burden when it, came, when it comes to caregiving um, jobs. So uh, we need to look at how the techn technological aspect is thinking about it from the wom woman's perspective. I don't know which question, this question should be directed to, uh, I don't know, you can help me. <laughs> Can you okay. clarify your question? Okay. Um, most of the platforms have been, have been made so that they, uh, they don't have the woman perspective in, in, okay? So my question is, what can be done? Because most majority of the women, they play the role of caregiving, either be it in cancer, be it in mental health, be it in whatever aspect. 
So my issue is if it's the woman who is using the platform to pay for a particular um, e-platform in the health sector, have we looked up at it from that perspective? Yes. I will direct it for, to Catherine as well, since she's asking about, uh, okay, there is a gap between uh, women digital literacy and the fact that most women, more women, yeah, most women are caregivers when it comes to health, etc., and they have the one uh, having to do sometimes transaction on the, on the behalf of other people. How do we manage to have more women friendly tech platform, basically. What can we do about that? Um, so. so first of all, as um, a woman in uh, technology, a male-dominated um, industry, the f one, one of the things I've done is to pay it forward um, as, as, a, as a woman, because during my time, it was very, very difficult to find inspiring models. So I know like um, earlier on, uh, I had, um, one of the panelists talked about highlighting one of the best um, women um, in Kenya. So for example, I decided to join an entrepreneurship startup known as Keroshe, which is run by Tabitha um, Karanja, who runs one of the um, you know, largest uh, Kenya breweries in Kenya. So I was inspired by her, and I decided to um, you know, find some source of inspiration. But also um, in a number of um, women um, groups, and what we're trying to do is uh, change the narrative of not sing, be seen as vulnerable or mar marginalized, because um, we can bring um, equally um, a lot of value to the table. So ensuring that if you're going to have a platform, don't look for the, you know, pity kind of um, you know, aspect, but trying to say, hey, we're bold. Uh, we, uh, if given a chance, we can also um, be empowered and also we can uh, you know, bring some change. So for example, like in the you know, informal communities, one of my view is not seeing it as uh, you know, vulnerable or mar marginalized, but I'm trying to see it as an equal opportunity. So for me, that's the value that I see as women, that we need an equal opportunity versus being seen as uh, vulnerable. Yeah. yeah oh, sorry. Um, should, um, we, we need to add something, then you, and then um, Nina. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have two things to, to uh, add. Uh, there's uh, the, uh, the Kenyan delegate, the man, and he asked how uh, SNV is, is uh, addressing the issue of cultural and religion barriers. And I remember I uh, uh, cited household dialogue. Uh, it's a tool we are, the SNV is using by making sure that when you're engaging the uh, women, these men are there. Uh, because now it narrows down to the issue of workload, the, the time use, and in every uh, media, we use uh, the Women in Agriculture Index to, to take the data and go back to these groups and carry focused group discussions and now engage the men to know that these women are spending more time in the house cooking, cleaning, and have no time to start a business. Something else is that uh, uh, we are working in eight counties in Kenya and culture is, is culture. And, and we promote value chains that co uh, complement with the Kenyan culture uh, uh, very well. Like in Narok, Narok is a livestock community. Women cannot keep cattle or, or cows. It, I mean, it's, it's uh, cows are a social status for, for men. So you go there and promote a value chain like chicken and, and, and goats, and men do not have a problem with that. Not knowing that now there's money in, in, in uh, dairy goat milk, for example, and the women uh, keep going. Uh, I will also say we use uh, the stakeholder collective responsibility. Women, I mean, dealing with culture cannot be done by the donors or the, uh, the CSOs alone. It has to you engage everyone in the community. Very well. To Njeri, um, I'll, I look at it as, as a policy issue. If uh, 
you know african setup or or worldwide the issue of ict policy does it have a gender uh, dimension is it gender mainstreamed and that is why now the capacity of having more women in it in ict we celebrate if we have uh, had we have women who made milestones in the it we we talk about them we uh, talk about their success we celebrate them and i think when we now have more women uh, on the table in the IT making these policies they can be able to voice the the, the issues of of of, of uh, women being caregivers and, and and the needs of women and now the policies will come down because it's it's the the startup you have everything implemented uh, has to start from a policy level yes thank you very much thank you Winnie. Um, Monica? You know, I'm going to say for the issue of, there are a lot of hubs in Kenya. I also encourage you to actually visit the hubs and actually explain to the, a lot of these techies about what it is that women want. Another group that is also doing amazing work in Kenya is Akira Chicks, which is the tech hubs ladies. They are young women who founded a group called Akira Chicks and they look at women issues in technology and software. I encourage you to get in touch with them. Um, and they will also be able to speak on software development um, about women issues for you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nena? Thank you very much for, for that question. The problem I have is when we fall back <coughs> to the them and us. They know it, they control it. We just follow, we obey, we can't complain. In the tech world, that's not correct. Um, if you see something that you don't like, say you don't like it. There's something called gender responsiveness. Maybe Zebib can talk to us more about it. Gender responsive platforms. If you go to a platform and you see something that is not for women or it's against women or does not give you the capacity that you want. You should be able to contact the people at the platform and say, this does not work. And please, I would, I would like to plead with us. Let's not just complain. Let's also contribute. If you see something that is not working, say it is not working. Here is my suggestion. There is something called um, testing, user experience. And that is one way you can be part of the digital world. You don't need to be a coder, a programmer, and all. We can be all of those. But the people that are actually, the, the skills that are needed most, you want to talk to these ladies, are the softer skills. How do I blend the colors? How do I make this more nicer to my customers? How does, how does my Swahili, how does it come across? We need language people. We need literature people. We need people who know more about the, the human spirit like yourself. People who do care. You, these are the people now that are critically needed in the tech world. People who can say, this is how this platform will work better. So please come in, contribute, bring your ideas, and don't sit and wait for someone to do it for you. If you don't raise your hand, nobody's going to see you. So please, even if you think you're being stupid in your asks, Go ahead and ask it. I have noticed you in this UNCTAD conference. You came with an agenda, and nobody has missed it. Congratulations. <laughs> Love it. So um, we are heading to. Uh, I want to start. I'll add something. That. Yes, and if you can continue by sharing any final thoughts that you will have. Mm -hmm. So just I want to, to jump on what, said, uh, what you said, uh, Winnie, uh, saying that culture is culture. Of course, it's true. But I think that so you said, Madame, uh, culture can be changed. And changed. Uh, I will not speak about Kenya because I'm not Kenyan. I can only speak about uh, what I know. If I take my culture in my country, in Europe, I could say you that... Uh, Yes, a lot of things could change in the good sense or in the bad sense. And what we got the statute of women in Europe, hmm, we are not in a so good position today because we, we, we had a very good level of rights, uh, rights on health, reproductive health and all those things. And we are feeling with the movement Me Too and all those things that hmm, there is also some movement in the other sense. So it's why 
culture could change, and I think that the platforms and all this technology helps to change the culture. It depends on the message that we try to, to vehiculate uh, through those technologies. So, of course, culture is culture, and I respect all the culture and uh, uh, what happened in Africa. But I think that we can change that uh, step by step, maybe not on an off offensive way, more probably on a way more, well, sometimes offensive, sometimes more soft, but I think that we cannot admit that it's like that. Uh, and, and technology could help us and could help women in Africa also to be not only more visible, uh, active, uh, uh, intervene in the discussion in order to say the things, and I think that it could also help to change a little bit the culture. So we have not to, I, I don't say that's what you, want, you would to say, Madame uh, Winnie or she, I don't say that you would like to say that, but I, I use what you said in order to complement it and to say that we have not to accept that the, the traditional culture is for all the time and oh, I think that we could do something with that, uh, but you are probably in the best place as me to do that because it's your culture. But I think that we have not to accept that as a fact. It's not a fact. Culture is something which can evolve, evolve which can change, we can be changed, and we, ha we have one of the, the tools to change our own culture, uh, in the bad sense or in the good sense. So please, use the good sense. And I, to add uh, à la fin pour nos amis... Lastly, for our francophone uh, friends, I would like to say that, of course, at Ankton, we are really trying to work trans, um, cross-cutting uh, way in all the areas, uh, technology and training and also all the other areas that in, by far remotely or closely are touching on technology uh, or development. And I think development and uh, developmental stages will be achieved if we put uh, gender balance, not women, gender balance, I say, in all our policies and to make a digital economy the heart of uh, development. And that's the best we can do in the years to come because we realize that, uh, we realize that uh, blockchain, uh, future technologies, we are nowhere. We're just at the beginning. And what's going to come will force us to completely transform our economies, even in the developed countries, and all the more reason that you should take this issue of technology um, seriously as a, an element to transform culture and uh, uh, in societies. If you don't do it, it will be done against you or in without you. So this is something we need to take uh, on board so that women uh, can have a say, it will depend on them, and also uh, the, the kind of pictures that women, men are going to give them. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Isabel. Aisha. And thoughts with us. Yes, I would like, thank you, Candice. Mm -hmm. I'd like to end up with uh, positive notes, I with positive messages I'm going to send to women especially. I would like to, to tell all civil society servants, all women working in civil society to go for it to challenge themselves and you will absolutely fall a thousand times but I'm here and a live example that I'm not dead yet and I'll keep I'll keep like fighting I'll keep fighting until uh, yeah I'll have um, more women in ICT more women engaging in uh, internet ecosystem and more women which are making uh, success stories. I would like uh, to send a second message for, uh, for the policymakers, and I would like to tell them that it's time to share some part of the cake. And um, yeah, they will be more comfortable because women are going to hold more responsibilities and they will invest in women and have a lot of profits out of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aisha. Monica. I think I'll defer to e-commerce. E-commerce is based on the assumption that you're an entrepreneur or able, it's about business. And I'd like to end on the note of business and trade. And the idea that women can be part of the trade platform. Trade is not for just men. And if so, then as women, let's begin to engage in the platforms of payments, of logistics. We have an example here, a lady in logistics, of technology and infrastructure and IT, and of understanding business acumen. I really want to emphasize that so that then we are able to trade. Um, it's not just IT, 
just using the technology, but trading in it, making payments and making transactions. What Madam uh, Durant talked about, whether we can measure ourselves based on turnover. Why not? Based on business that has been achieved by women. What type of business? How much? are we making on the table in e-commerce? So I'd like to encourage you that we can be part of the table of e-commerce as women. We have technology to help us in this process and let's be part of it. I want to talk to the academia because I'm from there and I want to encourage the academia that um, theory on its own will not take Africa anywhere. And, and, and this is important. And as academic, we must invite the entrepreneurs. You cannot be teaching entrepreneurship and you're not an entrepreneur. If you're going to teach entrepreneurship and you're not an entrepreneur, then bring the entrepreneurs to the classroom. Bring models of entrepreneurship to the classroom. Bring business people to our classrooms. We cannot be talking about theory. It has to be theory in practice. And theory that is applied is when it succeeds. But theory on its own will never succeed. What we are having in Africa is a lot of paper trails. And what we need to move away in our education system is an education system that begins to say that we are applied, we are practical. And practicality means we've got to change our entire thinking about education. And this is not just to Kenya, but to the entire Africa. Let's not have degrees for degrees sake. Let's have degrees because we are applied people. Let's not have PhDs just because you're a PhD you can teach. Let's ensure that we have PhDs of applied people. I want to end on that note. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. And I totally relate with that because back in the days when I was running the, the company Jumia Market in Cameroon, I was sitting on a panel in a university once and one of my co-panelists was a, teach, a professor in sales in the university and he approached me and asked me, oh, would you like to come for one day teach e-commerce in my, in my class? And I did. Long story short, the, the, the kids loved it, so the director of the, the school um, uh, called me and offered me to teach e-commerce and innovation on a consistent basis in the, in the school. And I totally agreed with that. It made a total difference in terms of student engagement, employability, and I hope that more organization, educational organizations make that decision. So thank you for that. Zabib. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the root causes of inequality are the same, ir irrespective of the sectors in which we are talking. Mm -hmm. um, it might be, you know, commerce today, but it can be, you know, health tomorrow, it can be anything. And I think it's very easy to hide behind the status quo because of the socialization that we have all undergone. And we've been taught to act in a certain way, to talk in a certain way, to be in a certain way, and to think in a certain way. And I always say, patriarchy is really a privilege for men. And men have no idea what it means in terms of what women have to go through just to make ends meet in one way or another, just to participate somewhere, just to be visible, just to be heard, to be seen. And so I think at the end of the day, it is about attitudes, it is about behavior, it's about the mindset. And the mindset is for both, for both men and women, for boys and girls. And so if we want to really say that we want to be inclusive, the inclusivity doesn't come from one way. We are partners in this, you know, in this dance, basically, or in this game. And so it is really, really important that we ourselves as individuals really reflect and say to ourselves, how do we feel and what do we think about issues of inequality? And, you know, like we always say, you know, be the change that you want to see. And if you yourself as an individual cannot act in a certain manner, then don't expect other people to change for you or don't expect other people to open the doors for you. So whether you are a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, I think it, the onus is upon all of us to really strive for equality but strive in an honest uh, manner and not you know, blame one or the other. That's what I would like to say. Love that. Thank you so much, Tariq. Alessandro? Uh, well, to mention trade, uh, digital trade matters to women and women matters to digital trade. That is to say we know that digital trade uh, is instrumental to facilitate uh, women's economic empowerment. Uh, and at the same time, let's not forget uh, what uh, women can bring to digital trade. We have seen it in general terms uh, in trade. We know that in order to create jobs in a, in a sustainable way, in order to have an inclusive growth, in order to, 
to create enough business opportunities, uh, we need to have uh, women in the economy. Um, the same, even more probably, since it's, uh, it's a sector which has been, well, until now, uh, dominated uh, uh, by men. Uh, let's not forget, really, what women can bring to digital trade. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Winnie? Um, I would like to say that uh, I have three points to the government, to the policy makers, and uh, to the delegates. So for government, I think uh, the main point today is that uh, fostering pri I mean, public-private partnership is very important. Access is one thing. Uh, usage is one thing. And I think uh, for government, we, sh we need, they need uh, a proper framework of how do we measure the quality of usage. You give a woman, women uh, phones, but how are they using it? And Nana said it before. And um, something else is that I was looking at the national trade policy for Kenya. It was launched last year. I mean, I think it was long overdue. And you, you find that e-commerce is, is a component that has been strongly emphasized. And I'm glad that it's, 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 um, it has factored in women and youth. But we, it's good on paper, and we need to see it uh, being done and, and uh, proper implementation uh, framework. And something now that brings me to uh, the saying that we should not allow social divides to be, to also, I mean, we already have social divides. We should not be having digital divides. And uh, to that, I would say that women economic empowerment should be a priority for everyone, for us all. And uh, for government, for policy makers, when we are making policies, we make sure with these women are there, the needs of the women, their voice is there. And it's up to you for the women. Uh, and I always say that you cannot be called to the table if you do not have something to offer. So as women, we also need uh, to step up to show that we can do it. We, we have uh, the strength to, and capacity to, to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Winnie. Catherine. So my final words will be in regards to the theme of this conference, the Africa, Africa's e-commerce week. Um, so as a builder and an ambassador of the digital economy, uh, one thing that um, the continent has missed out on is we missed out on the first, second, and third industrial revolution. We're going through the fourth industrial revolution, and e-commerce has a lot of opportunities um, to take advantage of. Um, at this point, uh, in, uh, at this point, you can easily access the same information that another development, uh, another developed country can um, access to via the internet or via the, via the web. So we do not have an excuse not to be active participants of the digital economy. We need to stop being mere spectators and watching from the sidelines and ensure that we are have the we. Um, have a seat at the forefront of the digital, digital economy because e-commerce represents an engine of growth and a source of inclusiveness. So my question to you today is, what are you doing to take advantage of the digital economy? Nancy? So I'd like to talk to us as women in the room, and um, I'd like to talk about our mentality. Many a times we, you know, sit on the side track and we're like, women should be given this, women should be... Are we really empowered in our heads? Because for me, I believe empowerment starts with you. It's something, it's an inner feeling, you know. Um, and there was this discussion the other day where they're saying there are no women in the boardroom. Why are there no women in the boardroom? Because when they call for applications at times, women don't apply. How do you expect to get there if you don't even apply, if you don't take that first step? For me, where I'm seated, it's when I'm planning to like, uh, uh, you know, like join my undergraduate. I've only done a diploma, and this is because of my family background, but did that stop me? That didn't stop me, because we know education is not as cheap as, as it should be, but I decided to invest in myself, read books, you know, like hang out to the right people and do maybe the short courses. So I say the grass is greener when you water it. So water your grass, 
by investing in yourself. Thank you. Love that. Amazing. Last but certainly not least, Nena, final thoughts? Be on the table. <laughs> Sit at the table. Remain at the table. Don't leave the table or else you end up on the menu. <laughs> Clap for that, please. <laughs> Sit at the table, remain at the table, don't leave the table, otherwise you're going to end up on the menu. I absolutely love that and I'm going to use that again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit with, here with us. Thank you for the people from civil society, the government, the entrepreneurs, the policy makers, uh, the supporters of members of the panel or whoever you came to support here. Thank you also for the men who despite the fact that it was a gender-led uh, uh, session, found uh, interest and the uh, value in what we were, we were about to discuss today. As final thoughts, um, not final thoughts, but if the, the, the key message we really want you to, to go back home with is first, um, whatever your role is, is to rethink the image of the African woman. As Monica said very um, eloquently, uh, being an African woman, woman goes beyond being a woman from rural community, goes beyond being a woman who needs micro loan and who has to work uh, in formal businesses. We need to think bigger when we think about, when we think about African women, whether when we think about when we want, where we want to take the African women or where they actually are, because you have entrepreneurs like Catherine and Nancy, you have executive women, you have PhDs, and, and it's important to tell these stories because representation matters. Um, also, we also have understood today that it's very important to uh, for African women and for people in Africa to invest in women's personal development, for them to get the confidence, uh, the drive and the perseverance to achieve the goals they have to achieve. As Nancy said, it's very important as well that we learn as women to invest in ourselves, in our personal, professional growth because that's how we'll be able to take on the work. Another point that was important, basically when it comes to bridging the digital divide, Access education is very important, and uh, having more women being using uh, digital technology as mere user, but also as value creators, as core technology designer and producer, and last but not least, as policy maker to actually have a proper seat at any table that is uh, needed. We also need, it, it, it's good to have the skills, the education, but it's also important because representation matter to have more network of women so that women uh, don't remain alone in what they have to achieve in what they want to tackle in as economy and digital economy actor. It's also very important to have mentors. We need more, more women to use their voice. Please feel free to use their voice and say whatever you have to say. And you have the right to be wrong, but sit in the front, raise your hand, and make your voice heard. Because by doing so, you are going to give the courage to another person to use their voice and to take on an um, interesting challenge. That being said, um, beyond this soft aspect, you also have the core element that are needed, which are the statistics, the data. We need to bridge the data gap when it comes to assess the gender-driven policy that are existing and the efficiency. We need to know at what data we need. We need to have a clearer idea what data are important to, in order to do that and to question the data we base or our analysis, analysis on. And Nena and Zabib uh, highlighted, highlighted that um, that issue very eloquently. It's important, whether it's in gender-related issue or in any issue that public, um, public sector, private sector, as well as um, civil society work together to have a broader perspective on any issue that uh, there is. And talking about policy and giving a seat at the table, it's important as well for men to give 
room to give space for women to sit at the table. And I really applaud again all the men who came here who raised their voice uh, regarding uh, gender inequality issue and or the men that are not here, just like Cisse, who allowed, who, who, who thought it was important, it was important to have a female representative giving perspective on these issues of women empowerment and digital economy. And yeah, so that's basically it. We hope that we go out of here with more um, interest and motivation to tackle this gender inclusivity. Uh, an equality issue, uh, the importance of digital economy because it's at the core of every aspect of our, of, of our economy today and in the future. And we are looking forward to engaging again with you in the future on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Candace. Right. Thank for you. <laughs> All right. Can we take a, a group picture of the the panelists, that would be good. That was a good session.